done, what is the benefit on a seller? I know the bank needs to get rid of it because they have to put reserves, mm -hmm. but here's a seller that got into trouble. Mm -hmm. What's the benefit of him going on a short sale versus letting it go to the bank and uh, getting a foreclosure in their credit? Since there are lenders advertising all day long, mm -hmm. foreclosure, no problem, bankruptcy, no problem, we lend you. Yeah, um, that's a good question, and it has to be real. It, it, it's a personal decision. Some people just go. Yeah, some, when they get to, I'm sorry, when they get to that point, it's really still hard to finance them. It's still a risk factor, and that risk factor is growing now. So lenders are actually getting more conservative, but there's still people trying to capture that business and making, you know, advertisement this way. So it makes it really tough on us because it's, it's a right. higher risk right now. Mm -hmm. So we have to look at everything even more thoroughly than. So it's not necessarily the case, but I know that there's people advertising like that. So it is worthwhile for them to save their credit, for one. But yeah. what's the difference between having a foreclosure and having this all of their credit cards with 30, 90, 180 days past due, the, the, even the mortgage payment? I know. The last thing, saying that a short sale is really so much better than a foreclosure on their credit is really false. Because it might be a little bit, someone described it like this, okay, if, a, if foreclosure and bankruptcy is a 10, um, maybe a short sale is in it, seven or eight. <laughs> it's still a big ding, okay? And the only, sometimes though, people just go, I don't want a foreclosure. And if I was looking at somebody, if you have a foreclosure, you pretty much stuck your head in the sand because there's so many other things you could have done. You could have tried to list it, and, and if it didn't sell, you could have done a deep loom. Now, the thing is, some people will, uh, a short sale is at least a way at least a way for them to have more control over the price that it actually sells for and that potential 9, 1099 uh, debt relief that they're going to have because if they do a deed in lieu or it goes through foreclosure and it's a, um, wait a minute, yeah, and it's, a, and it's one of the... If it goes to foreclosure, they have no 1099 because it's, actually, a, it's no, an that's even push. A, that's not really true. Really? Any, any time, they're getting 1099. Just, just as a matter of policy, as far as I know, and I did talk to one accountant who, who said, yeah, my clients are getting 1099s. I usually get them out of it for pennies on the dollar. We do an offer and compromise with the IRS, but they're going to get it. So even if they do a need in lieu or it goes to foreclosure or a short sale, whatever that loss is, they're going to get 1099. So if, if it's a short sale, they can say, well, I know that my loss is going to be here. If it's Deed and Lou and the bank totally screws up the marketing and all that and it's a bigger loss, then they have a bigger 1099 or if, uh, you know, whatever. But the thing is, is that I'm going to get clarification on it. It's a little bit of a gray area as far as I know. But if it's purchase money and it's a non-recourse loan, they should not have a 1099 problem. If it, on a non-recourse loan, I do not believe that they, if they file with an attorney, a CPA, their taxes for that year, if, if all they got to do is prove that it was a non-recourse loan, and they don't have to worry about it. And even if so, you know, what I can do is give the short sale back to be used to approve the short sale. Say, look, take this to your accountant, here's your short sale package, here's your proof of insolvency right now. You know, duh. If you did a short sale, you probably didn't have money to, you know. So just, it's, and then, you know, with the, the legislative changes that are coming up, it's likely that the 1099 is not going to be as, as big of a deal. Where, where it gets kind of sticky is those recourse loans with, you know, everybody refinanced or they got a home equity loan. And a lot of those, like you found with Countrywide, you know, they're asking people to sign notes to get out of the deal. And um, they're saying, well, if we don't do that, we're, we're going to come after them anyway. In reality, do they really have the resources to go after onesie, twosie people? How many people on a stated income loan probably exaggerated a little bit? I mean, are they going to go after everybody? I, I don't think so. The, the resources aren't there because I think in most cases, people don't, if, if they're in the situation, unless it was completely fraudulent and they made a business out of it, you know, they, there's no resources to go after. So why, why is a, an investor or a lender going to spend a lot of money in court to get a judgment that they, they probably won't collect on? It's probably not likely, but 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 if it is a judgment, it's a, it's good for ten years, and ten years these people might might strike it rich and go buy something else, and then hey, yeah, it's, it's time to pay up. Yeah, yeah, probably they'll get smart, put it in an LLC or something. Well, one of the investors mentioned to me a couple of days ago about an LD law, 
<clears throat> and then um, he was saying that um, basically the, the seller of a house, if what, let's say if a house has uh, $100,000 equity there and uh, the seller is not able to get the money out, but he, she is in a foreclosure situation right now. Mm -hmm. I mean, she's going to foreclosure in maybe, let's say a month. Mm -hmm. So she agreed to sell it. She knows she's going to lose that amount of money in her equity. And uh, so the investor mentioned to me that seller has a right to come back within two years with a lawyer to like, uh, you Receive know. the sale? I'm not sure, just like they, the seller can go after the buyer if the seller feel the deal is not fair. I don't know about um, that's what I heard. You know, that I, I did hear some things where there's recourse, and I can't remember the, the specifics. I probably have it in a book, of, and I'm taking another class, a three-day class at the end of this month that should help fill in my gaps in knowledge of, of California real estate law. Mm -hmm. But I think that if you use the proper forms, there's the... Um, Notice of default. Yeah, and, and you have to have that five-day right of cancellation. That's very important. And I think it depends on if the seller is a owner-occupant and they're living in it, yeah. that's, and an investor's buying it, that's probably the most big red flag there is. If the seller, if the property's vacant, it's it's uh, there's there's legal precedent to say that then the laws don't apply because that's the it's vacant property. Or if it is a buyer. Or if it's an owner occupant. Owner occupant buyer. And and then it can't be agent represented investor. Investor there's all these different back doorways you have. If you have an investor who wants to buy a foreclosure that's owner occupied right now, you, there's a circuit. What's that right? Circuit? Way. Some, way. Something. There's a. You can't do it the regular way. You can't be represented, or else you could get in trouble. And that's probably one of the biggest violations in real estate law right now is agents representing investors and foreclosures. Yes. But. Um, but I, as a listing agent, you're representing the seller, that's right. and you can preclude that investor buyer to have no representation, and you you can cancel an agency. There's a form not to create an agency. And right. have that and investor if, by, itself, if, by itself. Like this is on Sunstar. It's going to close probably next week. It, it, I had the approval on a buyer who was an owner occupant, and and a week before I a week before I actually got the physical. I didn't actually expect their offer to get approved because it was forty thousand less than what the bank countered at. But they approved it. They were going, oh my god! But the but the the seller had gone eh, or the buyer was like eh, never mind. And I'm going, I have an approval at a really, really good price, you know? So then I got on Craigslist and blah, 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 blah. And I got an agent who has an investor. I don't know if he's going to own or occupy or not. But the thing is, she, not, she hasn't been living in the property since November. So it's, it's, it, I think that they're, they're, the regular rules don't apply. Why did I start with this story? About the rescission. Okay. The, okay, but if she, let's just pretend like she had still been living in there. There's a way that I learned that I can't remember off the top of my head, but I can still pay, I can still get that agent paid somehow, um, but it's not the regular way. It's some other two or three documents that, that I learned about in this class that I took um, that I'll learn more about at the end of the month. But there's still a way for it to happen. You just have to have the paperwork be different. You can cancel the agency and then pay that agent yeah. a referral fee. Yeah, something like that. And there's like a couple of forms that are standard that you can use for that. So it, it, you can still work with investors. You just